Why is there no front seat in a London cab? Why are London taxis black? And why are we exempt from wearing a seat belt? Well, we're gonna learn all about it in this video. Let's kick off with a big one. Why are London taxis black? Well, there's not actually a specific reason as to why this is the case. But the most likely answer is that this dates back to pre-war when the majority of taxis were owned by proprietors. The only way of having a London taxi was to rent one from a garage, a bit like the New York system. But they opted for the color black because they're much easier to repair if there's any damages or dings, much easier to hide a blemish in a black color like this. Why do London taxis have this little side light? Well, it's a relic from where the meter actually used to be based here. Many years ago, the meter was like a little clockwork mechanism. And to activate it, you'd have to activate a flag right on this side of the taxi. It's only more modern meters that actually link to the light on top. And then of course, turn the light off when it's not needed. So it's just another way of seeing if a cab's available and a nod to the past of when the flag was once based here. No. Taxi drivers are actually exempt from having to wear a seatbelt. This isn't just London cabbies, this is applicable all across the UK. Reason being is this, imagine you're in like the Ford Mondeo, VW Passat kind of saloon that's common in most towns across the UK. Well, if you sat behind the driver, let me give you an example of what you could do. Yeah, very easily, this can become a weapon against the driver themselves. So it leaves the driver in quite a vulnerable position by using the seat belt. The same would happen on these taxis. People could reach inside of the partition, grab the belt, and of course, strangle the driver and say, oi, give me your money or whatever. It still is one of the very few exemptions of not having to wear a seat belt in the UK to this day. So when you're walking around London, you look at cab drivers go by, you'll often see them working without a seat belt. It's also really handy as well if you need to quickly get out and help someone in or out of the taxi. I always try to minimize the amount of time that my cab is in you know, a vulnerable position in terms of other road users. So anything that speeds up that process, such as not wearing a seat belt, can really help. So what are these numbers in the front and the rear of every taxi window? Well, that's the driver's license number. So effectively, that is my number. I am not a number, I am a man. The cool thing with these numbers is that they're actually sequential. So the lower the number, the older that number is. But it's not necessarily an indication of how long that driver has been driving for. In theory, yes. But over the years, if a driver loses their badge, I'm not wearing mine because I'm not at work yet, then that number has to be killed off. Because of course that badge can be taken on by someone and be used in fraudulent purposes. So you'll have seen this with YouTuber and cab driver, Mark Monroe. He recently had his cab broken into, his badge was inside of his cab, and as a result, he had to get a brand new number. There is kind of a rough ruling for working out how old that number is. For instance, mine begins with a 78. I got my badge in the very end of 2017. So you know that most of the 78 badges are around 2017, 2018. Badges in the 50,000s are generally around 20 years or so. And as a general average, it was around 1,000 badges every year. That has slowed down a little bit because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's a fun thing to spot when you're out and about. Also, the color of the badges. So a green badge is an all London license. That means we comply for hire everywhere in London. And a green badge driver is what you will see most times that you are within central London. You also have yellow badge drivers who do an in-depth knowledge test on a suburban area of London. These are generally the outer stretches of London. And often their knowledge test will take just as long as a green badge driver like myself, but it's more concentrated to a particular area of London, such as Greenwich and Woolwich, or Morden or Sutton or, or Hounslow, all these other places around London that us green badge drivers never go. So if that's the driver's license, what's this one? Well, this is the vehicle license. We get a new number every year when we take this taxi for what's called an overhaul, basically a conditions of fitness by Transport for London. They inspect the whole condition of the taxi and if it's good to go, if it's able to be licensed for another year, they'll award one of these plates here. These again are also sequential, but it's less of an important number because it just gets changed every year. You'll also find that inside of the taxi, there's a few other things on here as well, such as when this plate expires, and how many passengers this vehicle is allowed. This plate is independent of the driver. So this is to do with just the vehicle itself. 
I could keep this plate on and loads of people could drive this taxi, just not related to this cab at all. Whereas in the window, that is my unique number. What about credit card systems? Well, depends on the cab, who owns the cab, etc. To begin with, there's a whole list that Transport for London provide of approved suppliers of credit card systems. And there's reasons for this. They want it to be a uniform kind of design inside of all of the taxis, the ability to be able to have a printed receipt, and also if the passenger has any problems with the payment or if they get double charged, something like that, they can contact that payment provider usually through their statement it will have the driver's number in there as well as part of the statement it's all about having like an approachable system i guess however each one of these systems is different both in terms of the commission they take how they pay you and how you actually use the system for example when i first rented a taxi they had a system called cmt and it worked very very well for people with lots of taxis or fleets that rent out taxis to other people because what you then get is you have a screen up front, you log in using your unique username and PIN, and all of your bank details are associated with that login and PIN. So customer in the back pays for the cab, that gets sent on to this third party company, i.e. CMT. They then take their fee out of it before paying it on to the driver. And it depends on the provider as to how quickly they pay you, what percentage they take, etc. I'm with this company called Viva Wallet, and it's quite a good system. I get paid next day, irregardless. It's a relatively good percentage fee. What it does though, is that it pays me next day onto a business debit card. And I can use that for my fuel, for anything really, booking holidays, whatever. The incentive of using that card is it actually gives me cash back against the fees that they take. It's kind of a clever system in that way. Obviously there's still gonna be some fees associated with it, and I can transfer it into any other bank account if I wish to, um, but that's just one of their ways of doing it. So all of the credit card systems have their ups and downs. Some are really reliable, some are absolute crap, but you go through them, see what works best for you, and it's highly individualized to the driver or the fleet that rents the taxi. Credit card systems are also super good because you just have all of your statements there when it comes to the end of the tax year and you go to your accountant, you can just go, there you go, those are my credit card statements. It's not a mess of having to try and collate everything all together. Most of them have pretty good reporting procedures that just make it so much less of a headache. So, speaking of cool features that are unique to every London taxi is this partition screen here. Now, a lot of people think it's because of COVID-19. Wasn't for that, we've had it forever. Some people think it's for driver safety. And yes, that is another really important reason, but one of the main reasons is that we've just kind of always had some kind of partition with the passenger. Think about the old school hackney cabs where the driver would be on the roof and the passengers would have their own separate segregated compartment. Travelling in taxis used to be something that only the upper class and really wealthy people could do. So if you're a taxi driver, you're obviously like a working class schmuck. You're the one who's up there subjected to the wind, the rain, the cold. The upper class people would have their own private cabriolet, this kind of space that we have here. It's where the terminology cab comes from, from cabriolet. And as a result, they have their own private space. Another way of looking at it is Victorian Britain. Take a pub, for example. I think it's only recently that the Hollybush pub in Hampstead, it was one of the last pubs that had a snob screen. And a way of looking at a snob screen, it's a bit like those COVID barriers that everyone put up during the pandemic, right? Well, the Victorians did this, but they had a piece of translucent glass. The idea being is that the person buying the drink would not want to make eye contact with the server or the bartender because they are likely to be someone of working class background. They didn't want to have to look at someone uh, of working class nature. And it was that separation of classes across society. And that's pretty much the same as it is in cabs. That's why we have this divide. It's like, I'm just the working class driver in the front. This bit in the back is for the passenger. And it's still kind of that way now. It just entitles into a sense of privacy. And it's one of those things that just makes a black cab so exclusive that you have this private space all to yourself, undeterred by the driver, because they're just up front doing their job. Even features like the intercom, which you can turn on and off to interact with the driver. Just gives you that little bit more of a cool private space. So why is there no front seat? Well, we've never really had one. 
You do have a boot on these cabs, but there's not really much space in them for luggage and stuff. Think about the open portion of an old double-decker bus where people would hop on and off at the back. This was kind of a similar thing. When you'd hail down a cab, you would chuck your briefcase on this front open portion, so the driver would kind of be exposed here, and you would hop in the back. You wouldn't have your briefcase on you. There's drivers who do have these uh, classic models of taxi and they still have just like a, a stack of briefcases there because it looks like a nice feature, but that's how the luggage was always done. I have seen this cab, the TXE, with a flip seat here, but I don't think it was a licensed London cab. Because we've got to store the disabled harnesses underneath this foot bit here, even if I did get a, a good position to put a seat in, I don't think it's going to fit. <laughs> You'd have to do away with this storage space for the disabled harnesses because you need the disabled harnesses as conditions of fitness of being a London taxi driver or a London vehicle. I don't think you're going to be getting a seat in the front of one of these. So it will forever be the luggage compartment. So why do London taxis have this super tight turning circle of being able to do a U-turn within 25 feet? First off is actually a condition of the vehicle being licensed. So if you said, look, I want to make a brand new taxi for the London market, it must have this turning circle of some kind. Of course, the Mercedes Vito has a rear wheel steer, so they actually turn the rear wheels to ensure it still complies with that same turning circle requirement. The Greater London Authority, or the GLA, basically says that the turning circle requirement ensures that London taxis can manoeuvre pretty efficiently without causing congestion within the capital. But if that was the case, why do we bother having that restriction on 18,000 taxis but not on the 100,000 plus private hire vehicles, which have to do that pretty inefficient U-turn. I mean, I love it and it does make a massive difference in the efficiency of being able to just turn around, pick someone up and away you go. So mixed opinion to the turning circle requirement because obviously to put that in is a highly specialized and specific feature to these taxis, which invariably cost money, puts the price of the vehicle up. So would you want to do away with the turning circle requirement and then have a cheaper vehicle, mm, I don't know necessarily. It's hard to say. There are other reasons supposedly for the turning circle. I once heard it's because of the tight turning circle at the Savoy Hotel, and obviously taxis dropping off there quite frequently. Another story I heard was that one of the original manufacturers of London taxis was actually based in France. And when they brought them over uh, on the ferry, the taxis didn't actually have a reverse gear. So by putting a very tight turning circle on them, it allowed them to do a U-turn on the boat so they could just drive off in the correct direction. Mad, really. That might be one of those legend has it stories. It's one of those things that's highly specialized for this cab, just like the disability requirements. London taxis are 100% disabled accessible. What do I mean by that? Well, every single taxi you see in the street will have the same features that mean if you're disabled or have some sort of mobility impairment, you're gonna be able to get some kind of accommodation for that. Let's have a little look at some of these features. This one is a disabled ramp. Pretty easy disabled ramp, which also transforms into a step. This is awesome. Obviously we've got the curb, so that's a little bit redundant, but if you haven't got a curb, you're gonna stand on that and away you go. Super high visibility grab handles. <laughs> Fixing points for wheelchairs and even a super cool swivel seat. <laughs> That's cool. So I know what you might be wondering. No luggage and no bale of hay in the boot either. This is one of those ones that did apparently exist at one point, but has now been since repealed. And that is that every London cabbie has to carry a bale of hay in the boot, of course, to feed the horse, that would be pulling the carriage. The reason being for this was that they had to be supplied with their own hay and not being fed from the street, so from the taxi itself, that's why it was kept uh, in the boot. And apparently this hadn't been repealed until the 1980s, which of course saw combustion vehicles on the streets. So it's no longer a requirement for us to carry the bale of hay in the boot. But semi-related to that is the distance of the knowledge. Why is it a six mile radius of Charing Cross? Now, when we do the knowledge of London, we have to learn every street, point of interest, 
within a six mile radius of King Charles I Island, or thereabouts Charing Cross Station. Now I understand this because King Charles I Island is generally where all the distances are measured to. So whenever you see a street sign saying London one mile that way or London 10 miles that way, they're measuring it to King Charles I Island, which is a very small roundabout just below Trafalgar Square. But what about the outward distance? Why six miles? Because London's much bigger than that, right? Well, some people think it's because of the fact that six miles is as far as you could go with a horse without having to stop and refuel. It's not that reason at all. It's actually because it was just the metropolitan boundary of London at the time. You've got to remember that the knowledge was instigated in 1851, much smaller and more condensed place at that time. And then as it evolved through the years, it was controlled by the Metropolitan Police. But even though the radius area is six miles, we're not allowed to refuse a job until it goes much more than that. Yes, currently as it stands, we can only refuse a job if it's longer than 12 miles from where it originates from, or 18 miles if it's at Heathrow. The journey is expected to take greater than one hour, or the passenger is drunk and disorderly or may have no means of paying for the fare. I believe this was changed within Ken Livingston, so it would have once been six miles, much like the knowledge radius, but of course to stop drivers refusing those fares, they went to 12 miles instead. Because think about it, if I'm an hour west out of town and this job takes me an hour east, well, I'm two hours from home. If I've already done a long shift in the cab, that's obviously not safe driving conditions. So. If I was unable to refuse any job, then what? Where do you draw the line? Well, let's go to Manchester, let's go down to Liverpool. Who knows? Which brings me on to another compelling point. Why would a cab driver want to refuse a job anyway? It's money, right? If I want to make the most amount of money possible, all I've got to do is just spend the most amount of time in this taxi. But there's some limitations. Obviously, I'm going to need to sleep at some point. I might want to have a social life, whatever. It then comes down to efficiency. When I'm in town, I want to ensure that I am the most profitable I can be. And how can I be the most profitable? Well, always having a job on. So the old saying is, sorry mate, I don't go to South London or I don't go over the river. Depending on the individual driver's biases, it could be anywhere in London because what works for one driver might not work for another driver. But the main reason being is, if it's really busy in town and I get dragged down to Peckham, Greenwich or beyond, highly unlikely I'm going to pick up off the street. So it's not an efficient job. It might pay well to get out there, but it's only as good as me coming back in and getting onto the next job. My ethos in the cab is, where's my next job? Where's my next job? It's kind of like wanting to get a fix. It's like, where's the next place? So it's the kind of practice that did happen quite a bit in the past. Thankfully, it happens less now because these jobs are quite nice to get and you can't always guarantee how busy it's going to be. This was also you know, pre-private hire, pre-Uber, when drivers could pick and choose a lot more. There was a little bit more of a monopoly. Speaking of being efficient with your time and money, there's another way that taxi drivers can earn money. Taxi advertising. It's probably one of our most commonly asked questions on this channel, and I will do a bit more of a deep dive into this. But of course, taxi drivers can earn money by putting adverts in their taxi and around their taxi. It works multiple ways, but it generally goes like this. There's a few individual companies across London, such as Ubiquitous Media, uh, Cabby Media, Sherbet London, there's loads of them, that basically get marketing from an agency. So let's just say Boohoo wants to do a new campaign. They reach out to these cab companies and say, right, 100 cabs, it's gonna cost this amount. Obviously, they'll charge a price. They then you know, have to put in their materials, labor costs, etc., and then, pass a little bit of that on to the driver. Different companies structure it differently. And also it depends whether the driver owns their cab or if they rent that taxi. As an example, when I rented from a garage in North London, they said, look, Tom, you're currently renting from us. Do you want to put some adverts on the side of your cab? And in return, you'll get one week's rent free for the entire year. So you're like, okay, I was renting about what, 250 pounds a week, I think. I drive the cab anyway, so it's not a bad idea. Now, obviously, the company that's applying to the cabs probably earns the most. Then the proprietor earns a bit, and then it comes down to the cab cabbie that probably earns the least. If I own my own cab, then prices can vary between a thousand pounds to you know up to four thousand pounds, depending 
on the supplier, depending on what you get, etc. So the most common you'll see in London is something called super sides. And they are literally just liveries that run along the side of cabs because they're super easy to pull off, reapply and change at a moment's notice. You also get the full wraps which go around the taxi. Of course, these pay a lot more because there's a lot more advertising real estate going on. There's also other incentives as well. So let's just say a flagship retail store opens on Regent Street. They get five cabs liveried up saying, we've got a brand new store opening. What they might also do is say, look, we want those five cabs directly outside of our retail store when it opens. And they'll pay the driver a day rate for that. You know, it all comes down to the individual company and what they can offer, because obviously offering their product is gonna be much cheaper than them offering hard cash. So have I got any adverts on my cab? Will I get adverts on my cab? And no. There's a few reasons for it though. First off is the faff of going in and get it changed. Now, truth be told, and especially the super sides, they are stupidly quick at getting fitted. In fact, I wanna make a video that shows you how it works because it is literally like that bit in Grand Theft Auto, the video game, where you drive into the garage and it resprays in an instant and you come back out. There's about 10 guys all around the cab just ripping off the old one, putting the new one on and you drive out the other end of the garage. It's ridiculously good. But I've got to factor in my time to get to the garage to do that. It might not be at the most convenient time for me to do it and so forth. Secondly, you don't necessarily have control over what goes on your cab. So, could be an advert for Durex one week, could be Andrex the week after, who knows? And lastly, I do tours and private work. So, if I turn up with a particular advert on the cab, it just doesn't look as clean and presentable as a plain black cab. A taxi that can ply for hire from the street and have the word taxi on it is also known as a hackney carriage, a publicly hireable vehicle. But whereabouts in Hackney does the Hackney carriage come from? Trick question, I'm afraid. It has nothing to do with the area of East London called Hackney. In fact, it actually comes from a particular breed of horse called a Hackney. It's actually a French or Belgian breed of horse that was bred specifically for its low trot step pattern, which basically meant that when it was pulling passenger coaches, it was a much more smoother, more pleasant ride. So nothing to do with Hackney, all to do with the type of horse. Is it illegal to hail a taxi? Well, I've heard of Americans come up with this one. And in fact, sometimes the first time you ever interact with American, if they've only just visited London, is that they'll look at you quite confusingly. Like they wanna stick their arm out, but they're sort of almost like trapped. They're like, they can't do it. And it's because they have this notion that it is illegal to hail a taxi. Well, where's this come from? What's it all about? Well, in the literature, Apparently it is illegal to shout taxi because that could distract a driver. If you say taxi and a driver's driving away or looking somewhere else, he might look quite quickly. And then of course, problems apparently. You know, I don't mind if someone shouts. If I'm there looking at the near side where the majority of my hails come from and there's someone on the off side, arm out and just wants to do something a little bit extra to get my attention, then, you know, go for it. I'm sure you're not gonna be put in prison for shouting the word taxi. In terms of physically hailing one from the street, putting the arm up, well, I guess in a lot of other places, particularly in the UK and around the world, you always get one from the stand, right? From the taxi rank itself. And that was the way that taxis first came into existence in London. In the 17th century, it was Captain Bailey who first instigated the idea of a taxi rank, a, a section of taxis that could be parked up there, uh, ready for anyone to come along and grab a cab. He wasn't always able to hail them in this way. When concierges were looking for taxis, they used to use a whistle. And this used to be so rife in like Westminster, you know, you're talking in the, um, in the Victorian times, where the concierges would just be constantly whistling for cabs, just whistle, no cab, let's whistle again. And you can imagine how bad that would be, just all these whistles going off everywhere and such a nuisance to the public. So I think that practice then got outlawed. But in terms of hailing a taxi, nah. Put that arm up loud and proud. Let the driver know that you want one of the world's finest. So it might not be illegal to hail a taxi, but it is against the law to do something with the word taxi. So it's actually the word itself, taxi, that is enshrined in law in the same way that a security guard can't pose as a police officer. But why is this distinction so important? Well, a taxi 
i.e. a vehicle that is fitted with a taxi meter, is for public hire. It is able to apply for hire from the street, as opposed to private hire, which has to be pre-booked in advance. This is quite an important distinction for passengers to know when they're getting in, because that then assumes the trustworthiness of the driver, certain DBS, CRB conditions, etc. So people try and interchangeably use this. You know, go on the Uber website, you won't see the word taxi mentioned there unless it is actually referring to a taxi, not one of their own vehicles. They'll use it quite sneakily within marketing and SEO online. They'll use the word taxi to bump themselves up in the listings, but they can't say that their own private hire fleet are taxi because that is enshrined in law. It goes one step further in that in journalism, they can't use the word taxi if they're trying to refer to a private hire vehicle. So for example, there's an article which I'll link down below of a private hire driver who was convicted uh, of rape and sexual assault of a passenger. The journalistic article are so careful in their wording to not use the word taxi. They wanna use the word taxi because they know that will perfectly sum up exactly what they're trying to say, but it's not allowed because that refers to a different distinction of job entirely. The word in they use is actually, it says predatory private cab driver. But interestingly, the URL says cab driver, but they can't use the word taxi. Same goes with putting it on the vehicle. You can't just go, ah, you know what? I'm gonna advertise my vehicle as a taxi. So it's not fitted with a taxi meter or licensed by the local authority as a publicly hire vehicle, then it is not a taxi. So why does the taxi meter start at £3.80? Well, have a think about it. If you hired me on the street and the taxi meter started at zero, and you said, oh, driver, I only want to go down the end of the street there. Well, the fare might be 40p or 60p. So we get to the end of the street, it's 60p. Firstly, I'd probably be like, well, 60p, like, I'm so what? I'll probably just let them out and go, fine. But look at the real logistics of that. They've had to hail me down. We've had to have a brief conversation. They've had to get in the back, put their seatbelt on, make sure they're all ready. If they've got kids or if they've got a few items, they've got to get that all set and in place. Then we've got to drive to the end of the road. I've then got to stop the meter. They've got to get out of the taxi, then go, oh, uh, oh where's your card machine? Oh, okay, it's in the back. The card machine takes its fee and so on. So what might only seem like, I don't know, a 15 second job, a 20 second job down the end of the street, might have taken five minutes all in. And those five minutes really add up. And that 60p is no longer really 60p. It's different all across the UK. And in fact, London's quite generous at £3.80. Many start around the £5 mark. I think even with Uber, the minimum fare you can get within Uber is about £5. So it's really generous by comparison. And then from there, it goes up in 20p increments. The other thing with this taxi meter is that it's the only part of the vehicle that I do not own. I have to rent that. And that's the case for London anyway. I know that other districts and areas of the UK, they can buy the meter and then presumably they pay for the updates as they go, which is not the way it's done in London. So that gets updated once a year and that tariff is set by Transport for London. So I have no control over the price that displays. That's all set by our governing body, which is Transport for London. It's sealed, and that's what these little indicators here mean. Um, and this particular tariff is green. So this just lets me know that this is the most up-to-date tariff. They just change it every year. So it'll be color coded red, blue, whatever. In meter terms, the prices generally always go up. So therefore, I want it to be the most recent tariff. And I know that because of this green light here. You'll see it in other cabs around London if you ever get in a cab what these different lights are. As of August 2023, in place from April 2023, it's a green light. If you get in another cab and it's a different colour, you've got yourself a bargain. <laughs> if you want to learn more about how I update my meter, I actually have a separate video about that over here as well. And then finally, the other thing you have here is this uh, number. It's uh, number one. That means we're in tariff one, which is the lowest of the three sort of four tariffs that we have. Number one is basically daytime tariff. Number two is your weekends and between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. Just goes up a little bit more. Always starts at £3.80. And tariff free is after 10 o'clock. That's your nighttime rate or your bank holiday rate. You sometimes get extras on New Year's. Um, check out my New Year's video if you want to see how that tariff works and the extras that I get on top of that. That's applied uh, automatically. The other thing we can do 
is add uh, extras if we start at Heathrow Airport. £3.60. Why? Because that's how much it costs for me to go through the feeder park, so that just gets passed back onto the customer. So that's all the stuff you never knew about a London taxi. If you want to learn a little bit more about how much this vehicle costs and how much it costs for me to be a London taxi driver, that'll all be in this video over here.